Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for your participation in the IAS uh, e-lecture series on environmental and human health risk assessment. Um, my name is Hui, and I'm glad to coordinate this event. Um, last week, we have had Professor Asher from the University of Tübingen in Germany to introduce the topic of risk and um, uh, environmental and human health risk assessment. And today I'm so glad to uh, introduce to you Dr. Bartram uh, to talk to us on the environment health risk assessment, management and communication. Uh, Dr. Bartram is currently an executive director of the Terra Graphic Antino uh, Foundations. And uh, whenever you may have some time, please uh, visit the website. It is very well done and you can learn much more about the very interesting project uh, that the foundations ha are performing all around the world. And um, let's talk about Dr. Bartram. She ho uh, she's currently holding multiple uh, positions. Uh, in addition to being an executive director of the Terrographic International Foundations, she's as well a visiting lecturer uh, for the American University of Armenia. She's as well a consultant for the Médecins Sans Frontières. She is, uh, is a former U.S. Peace Corps Community Health and Economic Development volunteer in the Kingdom of Lesotho. Uh, regarding her um, uh, background, she holds a Bachelor in Science and Environmental Biology uh, from the University of Michigan State University, and she holds as well a PhD in Environmental Science from the University of Idaho. Um, for her professional interest, um, I can rest some point like uh, international environmental health, heavy metals, risk assessment, contamination characterization, exposure assessment and mitigations, uh, environmental justice, interdisciplinary sciences and environmental remediations. So from there, I'd, uh, I hope that you enjoy the lecture given by, by uh, Dr. Casey uh, Bartram on um, environmental uh, Health risk assessment, management, and communications. Thank you very much again, Dr. Bartram, for part your participation, and I will turn over the stage to you. Thank you. Sorry, Dr. Bartram, I may just have to activate. Sorry, your your microphone was mute, so we didn't hear anything. Okay. So I just activated it. Sorry. Okay. So can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, it's perfect now. Perfect. Well, let me go ahead and get this going. So I want to thank you, um, Hui, and thank IIES for organizing such an international event. This is a great collaboration and we're really excited to be a part of it. Um, I, as, as you introduced me, I work for a foundation called Terra Graphics International Foundation. And we are a small nonprofit. We were based in Moscow, Idaho, in northern Idaho, but we work all over the world. And we do work um, uh, usually with, often with mining communities, looking at exposures to environmental contaminants that result from extractive industries. And then we often work with both miners and the communities to look at how to reduce exposures, fully understanding that that um, economic activity is important as a way of life. And um, so trying to find ways to uh, allow for that to go on, but have people live in healthier environments at the same time. I'm going to use an example today from one of our uh, projects in Nigeria to illustrate the concepts of uh, human health risk assessment in a very practicable, uh, practical and applicable way. And then we'll go into some um, exposure mitigation, some risk management, and then talk some about risk perception and communication at the end. I'm gonna assume um, I wasn't able to watch the lecture last week. I'm going to assume that there's some foundations of risk assessment that have been laid, so I won't go into those in too much detail. Um, but we'll do kind of a quick background on risk assessment, focusing on human health risk assessment specifically, and um, what process we go through when we're doing that, including some information specifically on exposure pathways, because that is an important um, piece of the puzzle to understand in order for us to then intervene and look at some risk management options to uh, reduce exposures to contaminants. Then I'm gonna go into this case study I mentioned. We have been working on a project in Northern Nigeria since 2010, and it's a uh, human health risk assessment project. 
Uh, it's a great case study for us to use. And so I'll go through some examples from that project. Um, if there are any questions that come up during this, I have, I think I have a chat window open and a computer next to me. So please just type something into the group chat and I'll try to keep looking over to see if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, at the end, um, I'm available for questions and please, you know, feel free to email me or contact us um, anytime in the future as well. Risk assessment as a discipline has many applications. It's used to determine the safety of consumer products, uh, determining regulatory standards for drinking water and air, and setting cleanup standards for hazardous sites. There's a lot of other uses for it. Today, I wanna to focus on human health risk assessment at contaminated sites and how that is used to develop appropriate risk management intervention techniques, uh, specifically mitigating exposures in the case study we're gonna to use today. Environmental health means different things to different people. When I talk about environmental health, I think of it as a truly interdisciplinary topic. So in Nigeria, for example, we work with risk assessors, public health experts, doctors, engineers, anthropologists, community engagement experts, uh, epidemiologists, public policy people, the list really goes on and on. And so I just wanted to touch on the fact that really this is a truly interdisciplinary science and many disciplines are needed to, to begin to address environmental health challenges around the world. I'm assuming you all have seen this um, flowchart before. This is the overall human health risk assessment process. Risk really is just the probability of harm occurring. So we think of risk as a hazard and an exposure. So it's one thing if you have a hazard, but there's no risk if you're not exposed to it. And so the four steps of the risk assessment process are identifying that hazard, and then simultaneously a toxicity assessment and an exposure assessment. And then finally that all comes together, all that information is used to characterize what the risk really is. And you'll see this diagram on a few of my different slides to kind of show you where we are in the process as we go through the case study. So I wanna go through that exposure assessment in a little more detail, because I said it's an important piece when we start to look at risk management and interventions. So if we think of a very simple diagram like this, we have different environmental matrices on the left. You see dust and soil, air, food, water, and sediment. This is a pretty simplified example. And we can be exposed to these things in many ways. So on the right-hand side, there's a family from Kyrgyzstan, um, which is another place that, that we're working right now. Um, so we can see that people can be exposed to contaminants via breathing air or dust. We can also see that people ingest a variety of different things that might have contaminants in them. And the thing I wanna point out to you specifically here is that people do eat soil and dust. And this happens in a variety of ways, but I wanna to touch on uh, one specific example, which is incidental ingestion of soil and dust. This is something we see especially in children, but it does happen in adults to a certain extent as well. And the thing here is not thinking about children actively going out and intentionally eating dirt, Rather, the fact that kids throughout the course of their day, um, through just natural behavioral processes, they always put their hands in their mouth. And this is a normal thing. They're always putting things in their mouth, especially two and three-year-olds, but this happens with kids of all ages, and it happens all over the world. And when they do that, they end up ingesting soil and dust. And there's a whole bunch of equations to figure out how much soil and dust kids eat every day, and it varies in different settings. Um, but this is a very important exposure pathway in the Nigeria example that I'm going to show you guys in a little bit. So I wanted to highlight that here. And then a third pathway we can consider is dermal absorption. Um, that tends to not be as prevalent at these types of sites, um, but it, it can be an issue with certain types of contaminants. Now, another thing to consider is that all of these environmental matrices don't exist in isolation. And so we see that there's interaction between them. So soil is an important um, contributor to airborne dust. Dust can be deposited on our foods and we can end up consuming contaminants that way. Um, contaminated water can influence soil. Uh, there's an interaction between sediment, soil, and water. This could get a lot more complicated. Um, so we just need to understand that these things don't exist in isolation. There's interaction between them. And one final point is that when we think about the receptors, so for example, that Kyrgyz family on the left, or excuse me, on the right-hand side, they all are going to um, react or have different uh, toxic endpoints 
um, based on things like their age or their sex. So we know, for example, that children are a lot more susceptible to environmental contaminants than adults. Uh, their brains are still developing, and that's, a, that's one of the major reasons. And so we have to take into account that there's vulnerable populations within, within the communities we're looking at, including children and, and, and fetus. So that last diagram got really complicated. And it, this is just one way to organize all of that information. We call this a conceptual site model. And it's a way for us to calculate total risk based on the information we collect at a site. So once we know what the concentrations are in the environment, and we know perhaps the different exposure pathways that might be active and who the receptors are, whether it's children or adults, whether they're residents or workers, we can start to organize this information so we can do our final risk calculations and we do that characterization step. And in order to do this, one of the important pieces is understanding what we call exposure factors. So, for example, if there's a contaminated drinking water source, it's not enough to know that somebody's drinking the water. We have to know how much water they drink every day. And this can vary quite a bit. Somebody in a hot climate might drink more water every day than somebody in a more temperate area. Children and adults drink different amounts of water. And somebody who's doing manual labor is going to consume more water than somebody who's sitting at a desk all day. So we have to take all of these into consideration and we have exposure factors to try and help estimate that. But we often have to adjust them or make professional judgment decisions based on certain criteria and cultural considerations that comes into play, especially with food. There's a huge variety in terms of how much food people eat and what types of food people eat. And those are important considerations when we're doing our risk assessment. So now I want to go on a trip with you guys to Zamfara, Nigeria. This is a state in northern Nigeria. And in 2010, the worst lead poisoning outbreak in modern history was discovered there. Uh, officially, we know that at least 400 children were confirmed to have died within the first six months of the lead poisoning outbreak. And this was pretty big news um, across the world, not only in the environmental health field, but in the international, um, in the international news. Some very brief background on Nigeria. It's the most populous country in Africa. We were working primarily in northern Nigeria in Zamfara State. That's where the outbreak was first discovered in 2010. And a, a second lead poisoning outbreak was identified in Niger State, which is more towards the middle belt near the country's capital of Abuja. And that happened in 2015. It's the same source. We did the outbreak is the same source, but um, I'm going to focus on Nigeria or excuse me on Zamfara today for simplicity. You should also know just about this that um, Culturally, Nigeria is very different between the north and the south. We're working primarily in the north where it's predominantly uh, the Hausa tribe in, in Zamfara state and it's predominantly Muslim and that becomes important uh, later on when we talk about exposures. So this is my most text heavy slide. I promise the ones after this aren't so boring. Uh, in 2010, the Ministry of Health surveillance officers reported high mortality rates in children under five years old in some very remote villages in Zamfara State. And they reported this to a surveillance team from Doctors Without Borders or Medicine Sans Frontier. I refer to them as MSF. I'm going to use that acronym a lot. So when I say MSF, that's Doctors Without Borders. And MSF investigated and found villages where one in three children had died within the past few weeks with symptoms that presented like malaria. They tried treating the children for malaria, the ones who were sick, and did not see any response. Children continued to be very sick and continued to die. Eventually, blood tests were sent to Europe, and they identified extremely high levels of lead in these children's blood. And so once they realized heavy metal poisoning was the issue, they, they knew they needed some external advice because uh, MSF does amazing work around the world with communicable and non-communicable diseases and medical response in all sorts of remote areas, but they didn't have a lot of experience when it came to lead poisoning. At the same time, uh, the locals suspected that this lead poisoning could potentially be related to artisanal and small-scale gold mining that was happening in the region. And so at that time, when MSF sought advice from external experts in heavy metal poisoning, the local emir, which is traditional leadership in the region, they banned all artisanal gold mining activities 
in residential areas, in any areas where there were children. And this is an important piece of the puzzle later. So we were invited to join a team that arrived in Nigeria in 2010, and this is what we found in Zamfara State. This is one of the first villages we worked in, in Doretta Village. And these are fresh graves. They are children's graves, they're quite small. And there were many of them, and we saw this in many villages. Uh, it, was, it was a pretty shocking scene. And this lead poisoning epidemic was uh, unprecedented for several reasons. The first is that nobody had ever seen mortality rates like this related to lead poisoning. When we think of lead poisoning, we often only, we don't even see clinical symptoms. It's often subclinical long-term effects when we talk about lead exposure. But in this case, children were encephalopathic, so they had severe swelling of the brain. They were presenting with seizures. Um, some were going into comas. And that was very rare. We knew exposures had to be very high for that to be happening. The second reason that this is so rare is that this wasn't a battery recycling operation. So this wasn't a used battery recycling area. This wasn't a lead smelter or a lead mine. And so that was really confusing to us as well. How could it potentially be related to what locals suspected was gold mining? And this is what we found out that since uh, the price of gold had been skyrocketing in the past couple years, largely as, as a result of the world economic crisis, that people had really ramped up gold mining efforts in this region. They'd been gold mining for generations since colonial times, doing this in an artisanal way, so very small scale, it's loosely organized, there's no one big company or anything in charge, it's individuals going out. The second thing that happened is in addition to really increasing their operations, they started using a new vein of ore. From deeper in the ground, they started using dynamite to access this ore rock. And unbeknownst to people who were doing the work, that gold ore contained high concentrations of lead. So it was up to 10% lead in this gold ore. And the third piece is something I mentioned earlier. The communities are under Sharia law. This is a form of Muslim law. And one of the rules is that when women are married, they, they don't go outside of the home to work, especially in the very rural areas. They tend to stay, stay in the home uh, with their children and, and their families. And so in order for them to participate in this gold trade, uh, the work had to be done in the home, in the residential areas. And this, so gold processing was done in areas where children were eating and sleeping and playing. So this introduced high concentrations of lead dust into the home. And this is what the gold processing, uh, this is what the gold process looks like. So ore is sourced from mines outside of the village, but then it was brought into the village. So this rock that you see in the picture on the left would have brought into a village and it would be broken into something like pebbles or gravel and then ground to a very fine powder, almost like a baby powder or a talcum powder consistency, very small particles. That was then washed, uh, amalgamated with mercury uh, to select just for the gold particles, and that mercury gold amalgam was then burned, so it volatilizes the mercury, and you're left with a fairly crude form of sponge gold, which you see on the right-hand side. Uh, the next slide is a video that I want to show you guys that kind of highlights this mining process.
So that video kind of um, just as an aside, not an aside, but an important thing to remember is a lot of that processing uh, was done inside the home where children are living. So these are some photos of um, a, a common home in Zamfara State. Um, in the beginning of the project, we spent a lot of time inside the home. And when I say we, I mean women as part of our assessment team. So it's very, uh, all of our work was very divided along gender lines so we could work within the local culture. Men from outside of a family generally don't go into the home of somebody they don't know. And so a lot of our work in the beginning was um, men from our team working outside the home and women working inside the home. So I'm gonna give you a little glimpse of what that was like for me. We did a lot of interviews with mothers. We did a lot of observing children's activities. We looked at how food was prepared and we did a lot of environmental testing in the home. The image at the bottom where somebody's holding a machine to the soil, that's called a X-ray fluorescent spectrometer. It's a handheld device, we call it the XRF. And with that device, we're able to get heavy metal concentrations in soil within 30 seconds. It just tests a very small area of the soil, but we're able to get a great idea of what's happening in that area, and it serves as a really important screening tool for us to look at where there might be contamination present in residential soils. We also did dust wipe sampling, uh, some food sampling later in the project, but what we found was that there were high levels of contamination in residential soils. A brief uh, review of lead poisoning for you guys on the toxicity assessment side. We know that lead is a potent neurotoxin and that children are exceptionally vulnerable to lead exposure, partially or largely because their brains are still developing. And so lead acts as a developmental toxin. There is no safe level of lead in blood. The current level of concern in the US is five micrograms per deciliter of blood. Uh, at different levels of lead in blood, we see increasingly toxic effects, as you see in the graph on the left side. In 2010 in Zamfara, the average blood lead level in children who were screened was 170 micrograms per deciliter. Uh, and you can compare that again to the five. We tend to see encephalopathy around 100. Um, so you can see that most children were severely impacted. The highest blood lead recorded in a child who survived was over 700 micrograms per deciliter. That child obviously had some permanent brain damage as a result of blood exposure. So earlier I showed you a picture of the XRF. This is what we did with the XRF. We drew maps of each home and of areas outside the home, we call public areas. And with that map, we were able to indicate the different lead results um, that we found in the home. So this map was probably a little hard for you to read, but in the US, the residential soil standard for lead is 400 micrograms per deciliter. On this map, you can see concentrations of 28,000 micrograms, or excuse me, milligrams per kilogram. Um, so you see levels of 28,000 milligrams per kilogram, or uh, I can see a level there that's over 10% lead. That means it's over 100,000 milligrams per kilogram. The reason we did this method for testing homes and recording information was because we were working very closely with state and local government to implement this, this project. So both for the risk assessment and later for the risk management. And in order for this to be something that could be replicated after we left, we wanted to use rather low technology intervention solutions. This is something that the government continues to do without us there. So they don't have access to things like AutoCAD or GIS to, to map these kinds of results. But this is something that works and is something they can, can continue to do without uh, external assistance. The maps were also very convenient for us because we could quickly at the end of the day go back, check the data, and then make a photocopy of the map and return to the household the very next day and give them a copy of the map. And we would walk around the house with them and show them where we found contamination and explain the map to them. And it really allowed them to become more engaged in the project as it evolved. And that was a very important piece of what we did and it comes into play later when we talk about risk communication. So what we found in Zamfara uh, in the first two villages, Doretta and Argama, was that average levels in the homes were between 20 and 35,000 milligrams per kilogram lead. Again, that's in comparison to the standard of 400 milligrams per kilogram. 
we often found maximum lead results exceeding 100,000. Those the maximum results on this table. But we can see very clearly that um, there were high levels of exposure to contaminated soils and dust. This next video gives you an idea of how we worked inside the home. So you get a glimpse to see some of the characterization work we did. So at this point, we've gone through most of the risk assessment process. We've identified lead as the main hazard or the risk driver. We've done the toxicity assessment. We know a lot about lead poisoning. It's one of the most well understood contaminants that people are exposed to on a daily basis. And we've done our exposure assessment. We know that there's severe contamination in residential soils and that through incidental ingestion, children are exposed to those contaminants, to that, to that lead. And now we're at risk characterization. So we can pull all of that information together to really fully understand a child's exposure. So we saw that processing of the gold ore in the home, which had high concentrations of lead, resulted in severe contamination, primarily of soils and dust, but also incidentally of food and water, and that soil and dust contamination uh, interacted with the food and water as well. So we have that, that lack of separation in the environmental matrices. And all of that resulted in different exposures to the kids, but the soil and dust was the principal route of exposure. The Emir, as I mentioned earlier, had banned lead, or excuse me, gold mining in residential areas. So there was no longer active ongoing contamination of the kids' environment. However, the contaminated soil and dust remained in the homes. Lead doesn't go anywhere. It's a heavy metal, it stays forever. And so something had to happen in order to take away that lead and break those exposure pathways. So now we're gonna go into uh, risk management. And in this case, we're looking at remediation. To break that exposure pathway, the contaminated soil and dust had to be removed from residential areas. 
And we did this using protocols from US EPA Superfund sites. However, it was modified significantly to work within the local context. So where in the US we likely would have used heavy equipment, in this case we used uh, hand labor for the most part because we had to access areas inside of homes. And that was done with agricultural tools. So you see men in the photo using hose and they loaded the contaminated soil into the sacks you see. Those are, those are discarded grain sacks that we purchased. Um, and that was taken to landfills. The health and safety protocols that we worked with the state government to implement uh, were arranged in such a way that uh, they could be replicated for men who then worked at the mining sites. So they wore dust masks when they worked, they had specific uniforms that they wore during excavation, and then they had to shower uh, before they went home in clean clothes at the end of the day. And these were all things that could help um, reduce exposures when they were at the mining areas as well. After we excavated an area, we would go in and test with the XRF again to make sure there was adequate removal of the contaminants. And then at that point, we bring in what we call clean soil. So we sourced soil from outside the villages and tested it to make sure it was um, not contaminated. We found that it was often the background levels were under 20 milligrams per kilogram for lead. And that soil was brought in to replace what we took out of the homes and out of the, the public areas in the community. And this also served for, um, as a dilution effect. So if there was any area that we missed testing, we were bringing in loads of soil that had very low lead, so it acted to dilute whatever may have been left behind. So in this step, what we like to say is we know that children eat dirt, and we like to give them clean dirt to eat. It's actually quite simple when you look at it in that way. The contaminated soil was disposed of in engineered landfills that were developed uh, by the state government. And those landfills were compacted and closed at the end of remediation in the village. And they were monumented at the center and at all four corners. And that monument was blessed by the local imam as a sort of um, memorial to people who had suffered and died in the lead poisoning epidemic. This is a video that gives you an idea of some of the remediation activities. Okay, so this next graph shows you blood lead levels in children. This is um, pre-chelation blood lead data. So what that means is MSF has continued to work in this area treating children for lead poisoning using oral succimer, which uh, helps draw lead out of the system faster so that it doesn't do as much damage neurologically. This data, however, represents children before they start treatment. So it really is showing you a reduction in exposures to lead over time. And what we see is that from 2010 to 2013, geometric mean blood lead levels decreased by almost an order of magnitude. And this reflects, again, the fact that they're no longer being exposed to as much lead in their environments as it's the contaminated soil is being moved out of those homes. This project was built on local ownership from the very beginning. 
there are um, many ways to measure project success. And in that way, I think it's really important to, to emphasize the fact that this remediation work was done by the local governments and by the state government and the people employed in it were the people who lived in the village themselves. And so they really um, owned this project from the very beginning. In 2010, we had 28 international volunteers in Zanfara helping train uh, state, local, and federal government and, and village personnel, in addition to people from the Emirate. Um, as the project evolved, by 2013, when we were working in the eighth village in Zanfara State, we had two international volunteers. So we went from 28 to two, and we were able to do that because the Nigerians were able to take over more and more of the responsibility um, because they had the technical, they developed the technical expertise to take on this project. And that has been incredibly important for long-term sustainability and for capacity building. I mentioned that there's been a lead poisoning outbreak in neighboring Niger state in 2015. Technicians from Zanfara state were sent to Niger to train them on how to do this risk assessment and remediation. And that was really a testament to, um, to the amazing work that they did and, and um, their abilities now. I wanna move in a little bit to looking at risk perception and communication. I think many of you probably considered the question of sustainability here. Gold mining is not going away in Nigeria. Gold prices are higher than ever and people are gonna continue doing artisanal gold mining for as long as those gold prices stay high. And there's no one in the project who wants to shut down gold mining because it's really the only source of income in these communities. Otherwise, people are living on a dollar a day from subsistence agriculture. And so there has to be a way to maintain that gold mining activity without it impacting children's health. And that's where this risk communication really becomes important. We've gone over risk assessment and mitigation. But when we talk about risk management, there's a huge overlap in perception and communication. And this is where long-term management comes into play with what we call Institutional Controls Programs, or ICP. And this is a way to manage and sustain the remedy, that, that exposure reduction in the long-term. And I'm gonna go into this a little bit more uh, in a minute. But before we talk about institutional controls, let's just review risk perception because there's many things that influence our perception of risk. Some of these come from our cultures, from our families, from our experiences. Um, two of the things that can be considered very important are our knowledge of the risk and our control. So for example, if it's something we know very well, um, we tend to be less afraid of it. And if it's something we can control, we tend to be less afraid of it. Some people cite that they're afraid to fly in airplanes because they feel like they have no control when they're in that airplane. So even though we know that it's actually fairly low risk, it's something that really makes people nervous. Some other things that are important, especially in the Zanfara context, are choice. Or do you have a way that you feel like you can avoid that risk? If, if your choice is to either mine for gold and make enough money to um, support your family, or you feel like your only other option is agriculture, where especially with climate change, that becomes more and more difficult, you may not feel that you really have a choice to avoid that risk in the first place. And of course, the outcome is important as well. If the outcome is breaking a toe versus getting cancer, people are gonna view that risk in very different ways. So I'm gonna talk here about what might influence risk perception in Zamfara, but I wanna point out that I am not a local, and so I'm speaking to this um, coming from an outsider's perspective. Some things that we've, that we've noted working there for eight years is that the alternative to gold mining, as I mentioned, is living on less than a dollar a day. That food security is a major issue and it's becoming more of an issue with climate change and drought. And that in the past few years, there's been increasing security issues in this region, a lot more robberies and violent crime. And that's something that people have to consider as well. So why does this all matter in Zamfara? So you've seen this diagram before. You see that these are the different pathways by which children in Zamfara were exposed. And we know that that happened because there was processing of ore in the village and in the home. We also have noted uh, in more recent years that there's still lead getting back into the villages. 
And this has been an interesting challenge for us in terms of long-term sustainability. So people are still processing gold ore outside the villages. And there are ways by which that lead is getting back into a child's environment. Some of that is because people are bringing home ore uh, in different stages of processing. It takes many days to get go from uh, rock to that gold that I showed you earlier. So they bring it home to keep it safe. So that introduces lead dust back into the home. Um, Sometimes young girls are going, they go out to sell food to the miners and the food that isn't consumed at that mining site is brought back home at the end of the day and shared with the families. There's also some young children who go to visit their brothers or their fathers working at the mines or at the processing site. So there's many of these what we call para-occupational or take-home exposures that become important to look at with what I mentioned earlier, which is the Institutional Controls Program. So this is a program that's been developed and um, is being implemented by respected institutions locally. The most respected institution is probably the Emirate. That's the traditional leadership. And so we're working very closely with them. Uh, in addition to the local government, there's some informal leadership we also work with, including minor, mining leaders, religious leadership, um, and people in the community who are respected leaders for different reasons. This program is going to have to be implemented forever. For as long as gold mining is going on, we need to have a program that also helps reduce those take-home exposures and that also keeps processing outside of the villages. Right now it's done in mining camps outside the village. That needs to keep happening. It can't come back into the villages again. Otherwise, we'll see another lead poisoning outbreak. And this is a coordinated effort. So it involves people from the medical field, environmental field, safer mining, and it involves people who really know how to work within those communities. And those are, those are the local people that know that best. So what it looks like in Zamfara is support of mining leadership and safer mining. There's different uh, projects that have been implemented to reduce dust at these mining sites and to keep some of those take home exposures from occurring. There's a lot of health promotion. There's village councils that have been created uh, specifically to address this issue. And a lot of work being done to explain long term issues with lead poisoning. Just to summarize um, some of the lessons learned that we seem to, to come back to again and again. The first is that local ownership in this setting has been key. So early on, it had to be something that was owned by the villages and by the various levels of Nigerian government. And it has to be that way continuously. And we like this phrase that's used in a variety of different advocacy groups and settings that there's nothing about us without us. No decisions about people without them being involved in those decisions from the beginning. The other thing I mentioned is that we based these protocols, the risk assessment protocols, the remediation protocols on techniques that have been developed based on sound science in the United States. And they had to be significantly adapted to the local culture and socioeconomic conditions. So you take those sound protocols and you make them work for the local context. That was very important for us to be successful. We collaborated a lot with a lot of different disciplines and a lot of different stakeholder groups. And that, that interdisciplinary work was crucial for project success. And finally, these environmental health crises that we're seeing increasingly around the world that relate to all sorts of extractive industries and uh, different types of environmental degradation, some of them are going to be acute emergencies like we see in Zanfara, but some of them are more chronic challenges. Regardless of that, all of the solutions to these problems require long-term commitments, uh, local ownership by, by governments and communities, and they also require a lot of project evaluation throughout the course of this project. We didn't do risk assessment once. We went back and did it repeatedly to understand later what the take-home pathways were, to understand where we were having sustainability challenges. And then you adapt and you um, re-implement different methodologies to try and achieve that long-term resilience for your project. So with that, I haven't seen any questions yet, but I hope that there are some. And uh, thank you all again for joining today. And I'm really excited to be sharing this story with you. So thank you IIES for coordinating as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Bartram, for this very interesting talk, and you guys did a very good job. Uh, I, I, I realize that this um, should have very a huge impact on these villages in Africa, right? They changed their life, and you 
Um, so <clears throat> it might be time for some questions from the uh, audience. I may start first with my question. I believe that in this or you guys might have more than uh, only lead, uh, and that should be the major problem. But if there is any other uh, minor contamination um, elements that you might find in this source, and that might affect on not only soil but as well water. Yes. So. Um, in addition to lead in the, in the gold ore, there's also arsenic, cadmium, um, manganese, and mercury is used during gold processing. So we see high concentrations of mercury as well. Um, we use lead as the risk driver for several reasons. The first being that that's what we saw in blood samples. Yeah. And that that's what's easy, easiest to test for in the environment with the XRF. The convenient thing about this is if we see high levels of lead, we know we have high levels of other metals. And when we're testing to make sure we've removed the lead, we're also testing to make sure we've removed all the other contaminants. So we use lead as the indicator, but when we're, when we're looking for low lead levels in that soil after, after remediation, we're also achieving low levels of all of those other metals as a result. Um, so we use that as a risk driver, but we certainly see that there's issues with co-exposures and we expect that there's probably multiplicative or synergistic effects of being exposed to multiple metals concurrently for these children. Yeah, awesome, thank you. So uh, for arsenic, there is any arsenic in the water? In the drinking There's no water? background arsenic in the drinking water, no. Awesome, yeah. Yeah, so we, I think that we got another question from uh, Jacob. Has oh, TIFO yeah. heard about contamination in Dryden in Ontario? Would you be interested in helping the First Nation communities affected? I am not aware of that, um, that site, but I'm interested in it, and I would love to hear from Jacob via email. That sounds, that sounds like an interesting thing. Awesome, thank you. There's any other question from the um, audience? Okay, just uh, keep going with my second one. <laughs> um, and I see that you guys just do, uh, use landfill as a solution for remediations. Mm -hmm. And when talking about sustainability, there is any long-term monitoring program for, for that because you might have percolation of rain and uh, that could affect the groundwater as well, right? Absolutely. So those landfills are monitored by the state government uh, routinely to make sure that the cap is intact. Mm -hmm. um, we have installed some monitoring wells on some of the landfills as well to understand if there's going to be any of that percolation you described. I can tell you that one of the silver linings at this site is the soil that's present in this area mm -hmm. is a very dense clay laterite soil. Um, when it rains there and it rains heavily in the rainy season, mm -hmm. there's almost no percolation through the top layer of soil. We actually had to um, dig up a landfill after one rainy season for unrelated reasons. Um, and we found that everything underneath, this was right after it finished raining, all of the sacks were totally dry because that one meter cap um, was packed well enough. Uh, and really the rainfall tends to just hit the soil and run off uh, horizontally. So that was, that was a, a blessing for us at this site as well. But they, they are monitored in the long term. Awesome. Yeah, that's very uh, well done though. Um, any other questions from the group? I see that there is some people just joining us uh, right now. I guess that could be some problem of daytime, uh, daylight saving time in yeah, Europe that true. just delay us a little bit. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, I mean, if there is any question that you might pop up later on, I believe that you can feel free to send an email to uh, Dr. Bartram through the, to the website and she'd love to uh, um, uh, answer to you and go over that with you. Um, again, so thank you very much, Dr. Bartram, for uh, this very interesting talk and um, that gives us a very nice idea on how we should deal with uh, risk assessment in the practical aspect. And there is this very interesting point about cultural differences that we have to consider uh, in the process of reassessment that we, we, we learn a lot from you uh, today. Uh, many thanks again and thank you a lot to the audience to uh, join us today. Uh, hopefully we'll see you next week. Great, well thank you again for the opportunity and I look forward to seeing future lectures. Awesome, thank you. All right, take care.